Hello, St. Grace family and those who are watching, how grateful of God we are to be with you once again, to fellowship in God's word and hear what he has to say to us in this lesson today. Let's pray and then we'll dive right in. God, our Father, we thank you again for another opportunity to witness your goodness through your word. We thank you for your word because your word never fails. Even when others fail us, even when we fail ourselves, we can stand confidently on your word because your word never fails. Thank you for how you've blessed us. Thank you for how you've kept us. Thank you for how you're bringing us through this pandemic and this unprecedented time. We pray now, God, that as we study your word together, you would show us those things you'd have us to see. Speak those things you'd have us to hear. Teach us what you'd have us to learn so we can be who you call us to be. More importantly, do what you call us to do. Even now, Lord, sit Michael down. Let them see and hear Jesus, not me. Let everything be said and done for your glory. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For our time together today, I want to look at Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. As we continue in this pandemic, as we continue to go through this stay-at-home mandate, it has provided us with a lot of time to do different things that we may not have done under a regular schedule. Many people now have time to spend with their families. They have time to binge watch their favorite shows on Netflix and Hulu. But it also gives us an opportunity to strengthen our relationship with God, especially through the means of prayer. And I want us to look at that today, why it's important to develop our prayer life, even in the midst of a pandemic. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, from the English Standard Version, it reads, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus here Paul writes this letter to the Philippian church it's the first church he founded in Europe find that in Acts chapter 16. He's very fond of this church because of the bond he shares with its people. He's writing for them to send back Epaphroditus, who faced a near-death illness while Paul was dealing with his own struggles, especially under the Roman rule, where he told Caesar that Jesus Christ is Lord, opposed to Caesar being Lord. Because of that, they imprisoned him, put him on house arrest, and now Paul is facing some dire straits even in the midst of dealing with prison time. And he encourages the Philippian church to stick together, to be joyful, and to watch out for false teachings. Really, the premise of this letter is to tell them to be joyful in all things. You see that, that phrase joy used throughout the entire letter. And as we get to chapter 4, Paul is closing this letter out as he does many times with his writings with basic principles the church can use. He starts in verse 4 by telling them to rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. And in particular, these verses we have today, Paul deals with this idea of prayer and peace. How prayer and peace go hand in hand. It's an idea that lets us know when we talk to God, God in turn gives us peace. It's it's an important thing to remember, not just in Paul's time then, but in our time now, that if we want to have peace, peace is predicated on our time spent with God in prayer. That's why he tells him, don't worry about anything, but in everything by prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And when you do that, the peace of God which defies logic, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Paul essentially tells the Philippian church and tells us, an effective prayer life helps the Christian maintain God-given peace. An effective prayer life 
helps the Christian maintain God-given peace. You can have peace in anything when you pray about everything. When you go to God in prayer and invite God in every aspect of your life, God himself gives you peace that defies logic to where you can handle anything in life, but you cannot handle anything in life if you have not prayed about everything. It's important for us to pray because prayer is the foundation by which we get our peace. You can live through anything and you can have peace in anything when you pray about everything. And that's what Paul encourages the Philippians to do in Philippians chapter four, verses six and seven. No, first what he says in verse number six, he says, don't worry, just pray. That's what he says essentially in verse number six. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Again, you can sum up that verse in four words. Don't worry, just pray. But we can't overlook the fact that Paul addresses the reality of, of worry. He uses this word to not be anxious. In the Greek, it means to worry or to fret. It reminds us of the fact that worrying is real. Spare me from an individual who says they do not worry because worrying is part of our human experience. It is in your human nature to worry. We can't overlook the fact that life presents opportunities and challenges that causes us to worry, especially in an unprecedented pandemic. When you look at what's happening in your household, in our city, across our state, in this country and around the world, there's room for worry. When you're concerned about your health, not sure if you're gonna catch a virus, or if your loved ones are going to catch a virus, it will cause you to worry. When you're concerned about your finances, how you're going to make ends meet when you're not working and you're not sure when you're going to be able to get back to work safely to have stable income, when you're relying on stimulus checks that still haven't arrived and unsure if another one's going to come, there's room for worry. Even with time, we have been in this mandate of stay at home for weeks upon now months and it's not clear when we will get back to some sense of normalcy to where we don't have to worry about masks we don't have to worry about face coverings and we're not having this sense of paranoia wondering if i'm going to come in contact with somebody who has the virus it causes worry even with family and with relationships because now you're distance away from your family to where you may not be able to go to family you may not be able to see your grandchildren face to face. You may not have that same time that you once had with your family before because now everybody's quarantined. It causes room for worry. And that's not just even with a pandemic. That's in life. When you're talking about career decisions, where are you supposed to work? Are you supposed to apply for that promotion? When you're talking about your financial future, is this the right decision to make with health, relationships, Marriage versus single life. God, is this the right individual I'm supposed to be with? Or am I supposed to be in this state? I'm tired of being alone. All of these different facets of life causes us to worry. And if we're not careful, our worrying becomes sin. Why do you say that? I say that because worrying puts time, effort, and energy into circumstances instead of into God. Worry makes the circumstance the object of our affection. Whenever you worry, whenever you begin to fret, you put that circumstance in the place of God. It consumes your time. It controls your affections and your emotions because you're so engulfed. You're so consumed about what's happening with that circumstance that you don't even think about God. I agree with John McGoffin, who tells us fret and worry indicate a lack of trust in God's wisdom, his sovereignty, and his power. Worrying is real. Worrying becomes 
a sin. And I know we like to cosmetize sin to be something scandalous, like alcohol and other activities that lead to a tangible result. But worrying becomes a sin because then you idolize the circumstance more than you worship God. Here Paul tells us, even though worry is real, for the Christian, stop it. Do not be anxious. He tells us there's a better alternative for the believer than to worry. It's called prayer. If it causes you to worry, that means it's a call for you to pray. If it consumes you so that it causes you to lose sleep at night, to have a reckless mind, to wonder about it every moment of every day, that is really a call for you to get on your knees and pray. If it causes you to worry, that means that's a call for you to pray. And that's what Paul tells the Philippians here. Don't be anxious for anything, but in everything, by prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving, make your request known to God. No, he says, in everything, pray. In every aspect of your life, Pray. Prayer invites God into every aspect of our lives. When you begin to pray about everything, you're inviting God in and saying, Lord, I want you to occupy this space that has caused worry in my life. When you invite God in, you're inviting God into the living room. You're inviting him into the kitchen. You're inviting him into the dining area. You're inviting him into your den, your bedroom, your bathroom, every aspect of life. That lets us know there's no aspect in our life that excludes the opportunity of prayer. That you can pray to God about everything, whether it be what happens on your job, whether it be troubles in your home, financial issues, concerns about politics in the White House relationship issues, emotional concerns, mental health issues, distress, whatever aspect, it is still an opportunity for you to go to God in prayer because you can invite God in every aspect of your life. And then note the elements that Paul describes. He says, in everything by prayer, which is communion with God. Then he says, supplication, which is earnest prayer. It's those prayers you pray that you don't want to get rid of. It's not just one of those fly-by-night prayers that you say, God help me, and then you go to sleep. It's one of those wrestling with Jacob type prayers that you won't let go until God blesses your soul. That's what it means to have supplication. And then he says, thanksgiving, which means in our time of prayer, it shouldn't always be about God bless me, but it should also be about God, I thank you. That even in the midst of what I'm going through, even in the midst of me making my requests known, there's still space for me to tell God, thank you. So with these elements of prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving, it also lets us know there's room to pray. There's room to earnestly pray. And there's room to be thankful to God in every aspect of life. That even in those places where you worry, there's still room to be grateful because while you're still worried about finances, it's an indication that you can still be thankful that God has blessed you in a way that you've been able to make ends meet even when you don't know how ends are going to be met. That even in the midst of health concerns, you still can thank God that God has kept you relatively healthy for this whole pandemic process. Even when you don't know when it's going to end, there's still room to be thankful to say, God, thank you for keeping me day by day as we are waiting for that time to get back to some sense of normal life. That we can pray, earnestly pray, and be thankful about every aspect of our life. That's what Paul tells us, that in everything by prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Now it's interesting that Paul says this because Paul says this knowing that God knows everything. So why is it that we need to make our requests known to God when God already knows our requests? 
I agree with Dr. Tillis Chen who says prayer does not inform God. Prayer inspires you. Know here that Paul is telling them individually to let your requests be made known to God. It's an inspirational moment to where you can go to God for yourself and tell God what you need. And God made that possible through Jesus Christ. And as Christ died at the cross, the Bible tells us that the tent of the temple was ripped into two, top to bottom, to where God opens up his availability to everyone who comes to him. That's why Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16 reminds us that we can come boldly before the throne of grace and find help in time of need. That we don't need to go to a priest who has his own problems. We don't need to go to another preacher who has his own problems. We can go to God for ourselves and make our requests known. You have a prime opportunity to have personal intimacy with the almighty God. What a powerful privilege to have that you can go to God for yourself. That's why the hymn writer said Jesus is on the main line. You can tell him what you want. You don't have to wait for somebody else to plug you through. You can go to God for yourself. And thank God that we're able to talk to God because we're talking to somebody who already knows what we go through. We're not talking to somebody else who can't do something about our situation. We're talking to a God who already knows and has the ability to do something about it. This idea of prayer and peace that's presented in Philippians chapter 4 is the same thing that Jesus discusses in Matthew chapter 6 where he tells his disciples and tells those who are listening to the Sermon on the Mount to be intentional in prayer and not to worry about anything because your father knows what you stand in need of. Before you even ask God anything, he already knows. It's an opportunity for you to come to him and say, Lord, I need your help. And when you come to God saying that you need his help, God is able to do something about it. He's shown that consistent in scripture, Philippians 4, 19, and my God shall supply your need according to his riches in glory. In Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, now to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think according to the power at work in us. In Jude 24 and 25, now to him who is able to keep us from stumbling and present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. When we go to God and make our requests known to God, God is able to do something about our situation. That's why you need to go to God because God is able. And when you pray, when you unburden your soul in times of prayer, God then is able to guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus with his peace. That's what he says in verse number seven. He tells us, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Note how verse number seven begins. He says, and which means it's a continuation of what happens in verse 6. He gives us a promise in verse number 7, but you cannot embrace that promise in verse 7 if you don't apply the principle in verse 6. If you want peace, it happens after prayer. That's why the hymn writer said, Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pains we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. If you want to experience the peace of God, you have to spend time with prayer in God. He says, the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. No, this peace comes from God. It's not man-made or manufactured peace. It comes from a divine place. But note what it does. It first of all surpasses all understanding. It's not meant to make sense. That when you experience the peace of God, it's not going to make sense to you. 
It's not going to be something that you can explain. It's not something that's going to be easy to relate to somebody else that you'll be able to sing while you're in the rain because you have peace. And people are going to ask you, how are you able to sing in the midst of a storm? All you can say is, I have the peace of God. That even when storms are raging and a pandemic is going, you're still happy, you're still smiling, you're still singing, you're still shouting, you're still in a positive spirit. People are going to ask you how, and the only way you can explain it is, I have the peace of God. But I want us to know where that peace resides. Notice what he says at the end of verse 7, that this peace of God, which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds. When it says hearts and minds in the original language, it's referring to the inner man, the inner being, the mind and the soul. It's an internal conviction despite external circumstances. This shows us that for believers, peace is not for our problems. Peace is for God's people. Peace is not for the problem. Because if God can change circumstances, you can explain how a circumstance changed. I got a promotion. I got out of that bad environment. I got out of that bad relationship. I got more money to deal with it. You can explain those things. But when God keeps you in the midst of a bad circumstance, you can't explain it. Because peace was not made for problems. We're always going to experience problems. This pandemic is just the latest in the Rolodex of the world's problems. It's coronavirus today. It's going to be an election tomorrow. And after tomorrow, it'll be other health issues, other issues we face. But when it comes to the peace of God, peace comes within our hearts and minds to keep us in the midst of whatever problem we face. So don't look for God to change the situation when God's going to give you peace to handle the situation because peace was never made for the problem. Peace was made for God's people and it will guard your heart and your mind. It will be able to keep you even when you can't keep yourself. And it does it all because it's in Christ Jesus. So if you want to experience this peace, Spend time with God in prayer because you can have peace in anything when you pray about everything. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the reminder of how peace and prayer go together. Forgive us for the moments we spent more time worrying than we did praying. Forgive us for making our worries the object of our affection instead of you. That as we hear this word, help us to be mindful of the fact that you have given us an alternative to our worries called prayer. That we can come to you personally and passionately, making our requests known to you in every aspect of our life. And that when we do so, you have promised us your peace that we can't understand, but will keep us internally, even when we face external circumstances. Help us be mindful of the fact, God, that even when you don't change the situation, you'll give us peace through every situation. We honor you and bless you today for your word. In Jesus' name.